All right, folks, without further ado, I present you the EFF. Thank you. Uh, th thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are here to talk today about searching and seizing your laptop. Uh, I saw that, uh, well, pretty much all of you. Hold this? It. Just don't hold around this part. Oh. Yeah, if you hold that, that's worse. Yeah, that's, that should be good. Let's see. Is that any, is that any better? All right, so we're, we saw uh, almost all of you, if not all of you, have uh, laptops, uh, and this is something in which you are, a lot of personal information is stored inside that laptop, uh, and it is something which you want to keep private. And so the question we're, we're asking today is, when can the government get access to that information? Uh, and we're going to start with first principles. Uh, here, here in the United States, we have the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment limits the ability of government uh, to search and seize evidence uh, without a warrant. And it protects against unreasonable searches and seizures. Uh, so there's important, a number, number of key words there. Uh, what is reasonable? What is a search? What is a seizure? Um, and so over the last uh, couple hundred years, courts have been looking at what the Fourth Amendment means and expanding upon the, these rules. Um, so starting out with some of the b basic definitions, uh, what is a search? A search occurs when you have an uh, uh, expectation of privacy and that expectation is infringed. Uh, sorry, an expectation that society is prepared to consider reasonable and that is infringed. And a seizure is when there is some meaningful interference with your possessory interests in the property. So a key phrase that has evolved over the years is the reasonable expectation of privacy. And this phrase comes up a lot in court cases. It occurs when you have an actual subjective expectation of privacy. You actually believe that it's private. But even if you actually honestly believe it's private, you also have to have an expectation that society is prepared to recognize as reasonable. And so this means that you can't just unreasonably believe that something is private and, and get the, the benefit of this, uh, uh, of this Fourth Amendment. So ordinarily, if you have a reasonable expectation of privacy, the government must obtain a warrant or fall within one of the exceptions to the warrant requirement. Um, the good news is that as a general matter and as a starting point, you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in the contents of your laptop. So yay, you have to, uh, the government either has to get a warrant or fall within one of the uh, exceptions. And some of the reason for this is because the courts have recognized that a personal computer is a repository for private information the computer's owner does not intend to share with others. And for most people, I'm quoting from a court case here, uh, for most people, their computers are their most private spaces. And that was recognized by uh, a court out of the Tenth Circuit in United States versus Andres. And this is a case in which EFF filed a uh, amicus brief, a friend of the court brief, to help convince them to do the right thing. So you start out in this good place, uh, but then the question is, when will you lose that? Um, there are a couple ways that you can uh, lose it just uh, to begin with. Um, you can lose it if you are sharing it. So if there is a shared drive on your computer and you're sharing it with others, courts might find that mean that you have to put that outside of the scope of your reasonable expectation of privacy. If you are sharing files over a peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, courts might say that, that those files are outside of the scope of where you have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, and then you can give consent. Uh, so even if you start out with a reasonable expectation of privacy, if the government comes along and says, hey, can we search your laptop? And then you say yes, well, then the Fourth Amendment isn't going to protect you much uh, after that point. However, consent can be revoked at any time prior to the search being completed. So if you're feeling some pressure, you uh, ended up saying, yes, you can search my laptop and then have a few moments to think about it and decide really that it wasn't a good idea, you can revoke it until the, the search is completed. In those few moments, they remember what we had to say up here. <laughs> That's right. Think back to this. Think, oh, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have consented to that. And you probably shouldn't consent to it. Um, <laughs> if there are multiple users of a computer, as a general matter, any one of them 
could consent. So if you, if you have a, a computer that is shared with others, if others have access privileges to it, uh, then uh, you have to trust everybody with access privileges to uh, not give consent uh, in inappropriate circumstances. Uh, however, courts have recognized that that consent is not for everything in the computer if you've taken measures to show that you're still expecting privacy. So if your files are encrypted, uh, password protected, such that someone has access to your computers, but not access to all of the files on the computers, their consent only goes so far as they're authorized to access. So this is a good reason to uh, have uh, encrypted files on your computers and make sure you're not giving those passwords to, uh, to other people. Uh, a couple other consent circumstances, if you are a minor, if you're uh, under 18, parents can consent on your behalf. Uh, generally, spouses can consent uh, for each other. But again, uh, if you have a password protection or other uh, uh, encryption that will keep the spouse from being able to access the files, the spouse can only consent to the extent that they have the access. Um, and sometimes consent can be uh, uh, implicit, so uh, uh, you know, be careful as to, as to what you are saying, and probably it's best if there's a circumstance in which consent may be coming up and you want to be maximum protection of your rights, uh, you want to be clear that you are not consenting. Um, so for example, in a case where someone invited an officer to take a look at the computer, uh, you know, it, it might have been argued that the consent was simply to perhaps open it up and take a brief look around, but when the officer continued to look deeper and start opening files and examining them and the defendant failed to object to the more thorough search, the court found that the consent uh, had, had expanded to that. And another case uh, was a case involving uh, consent to search a car. Um, and uh, the court said, okay, well, you uh, gave consent to search the car, and so that included the, uh, the memory of the seller phone that was in the car. Um, now, what we're talking about so far is government searches. Now, there's another category of searches, private searches, and the Fourth Amendment doesn't protect you against private activities, you know, unless the private person is acting as an agent of the government. Uh, and Jennifer is going to talk more about private searches. But let me briefly go through some of the exceptions to the warrant requirement. Um, so if a search is not going to be found to be unconstitutional, even though it doesn't have a warrant, if it falls into one of the various exceptions. One is exigent circumstances. This means that there is a, in a sort of a, an emergency uh, where the, the evidence is in imminent danger of being destroyed, um, the, the, there's a threat to the police, uh, when the police are in hot pursuit of a suspect, uh, the suspect is likely to f uh, flee before the officer can search, uh, do a search warrant. Uh, courts have found that these emergency circumstances can allow for a, uh, a warrantless search. But in general, dealing with laptops, this is enough to support the warrantless seizure. They can grab the laptop, but then they properly should hold on to it until they can secure a warrant later, if they can secure a warrant later, uh, and, and not do a, a search until they've gone through the process of getting that warrant. Uh, one of the arguments that has come up in a laptop context with this is the government has argued that uh, the, the possibility that the battery might die uh, requires them to, to search uh, the computer uh, quickly because uh, who knows what might be lost if the battery dies, uh, as opposed to suppose, like finding a plug. Uh, the next category uh, of exceptions to the search requirement is search incident to arrest. Um, and you know, this, this is generally a category for uh, when uh, the, uh, you know, they're taking somebody into custody, they're looking for like weapons or, or things like that on their person, um, something that can be used to affect their escape, like their uh, uh, lock picking set, um, or if there's a, a need to prevent the, the loss or, or um, destruction of evidence. Um, and so uh, this, uh, can be a fairly limited uh, exception, 
Uh, so for example, there was a case in which uh, the, uh, the officers uh, grabbed a footlocker and uh, they, they searched it 90 minutes after the arrest. And of course, that was not a search uh, incident to the arrest. You know, it has to have a certain amount of immediacy to it. And so it doesn't give the police free reign to search uh, anything uh, for investigatory purposes. It has to be uh, limited. Uh, so there was a recent case, which is uh, about cell phones, so somewhat analogous to searching laptops, um, where the, the Northern District of California federal court uh, said that the exception should be address the need of law enforcers to seize weapons or other things that might be used to assault an officer, uh, affect an escape, as well as the need to prevent the loss or destruction of evidence. Uh, and therefore, they found that cell phones were, were protected by the Fourth Amendment. Um, because they didn't fall within that category, and the court also uh, importantly noted, uh, you know, good policy reason before behind this is that uh, cell phones can store highly personal information, uh, can record the most private thoughts and conversations through email, through text, through voice, and instant messages, and of course, all these things also apply even more so to laptops. A um, couple other categories: plain view. Uh, this is if uh, the, uh, the government is looking for one thing but then sees another thing while, while they're in the, in the course of looking at it. Um, and Jennifer will talk a little bit more about the plain view exception. Uh, there is a border search exception. So your rights are different when you're crossing a border. Uh, and Marsha will discuss that in more uh, detail. Uh, and then uh, in addition to your Fourth Amendment rights, there are also some statutes that uh, can uh, protect uh, your, your information. And Kevin will talk a little bit about more about those. So with that, I will turn it over to Jennifer. Does this one work? OK. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Kurt. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some examples, cases that EFF's been involved in or that I was involved in before I came to EFF. There are some examples of computer searches and just hope that these illustrate a little bit some of the difficult questions. So one of the things um, you know, we're talking about with, in terms of consent or expectation of privacy has to do with com when computers are shared. So I think for most of us, we have our laptops. We may be the only person who uses our laptop. Um, but if you have a home computer, you might share it with your roommates or your spouse or, or somebody like that and have different accounts on the machine. How many people here have a situation like that? They have some computer that they have shared accounts on with other people. Okay, so you guys are probably thinking to yourselves, who can I really trust? You know, can I trust these, uh, these people I have shared accounts with not to crumble when the cops come to the door and want to search my computer? And, and what is the effect of having different accounts on the machine? Um, because password protection is complicated, right? Something could be password, you might need a password to access it because it's encrypted, or you might just need a password to access it because the machine's set up to have different accounts. And this was the issue that we dealt with in the Andrus case. Um, in this case, the uh, uh, police came by and got consent from the aged father of the defendant to search and seize the computer that was at that house. And Mr. Andrus had had an account on the machine um, that he had to log into when he was surfing his child pornography. Um, the father was not actually authorized to use the machine. He didn't know how to use a computer or anything like that, but the police took it and they searched it anyway. And um, you guys may or may not know this, but the forensic software that the FBI uses to do computer searches, NCASE, doesn't actually respond respect the um, divisions of, of password protected accounts um, or accounts on the machine in the same way that the user might approach it if you were just to go to the machine and type on the keyboard and see that it you know, has a list of people who are there to be allowed to use it. So um, the question was, was the consent of the father adequate enough to give police access to the rest of the machine so that they could get a hold of the evidence that they had about, uh, against Mr. Andrus based on the consent exception and not on the Fourth Amendment um, and, not by, and without having gotten a warrant? Um, and, and, you know, there, I think, for the court, there was a real issue about what the officers knew or should have known at the time that they took the machine from the father and what was right there. So the, the thing there technologically that I think is the lesson to learn is that even if you have, if you have accounts, separate accounts, that may help you show that you have an expectation of privacy. Kurt and I share a computer. He doesn't have access to my stuff. I don't have access to his stuff. I still have an expectation of privacy. I haven't shared it. What if we share it a little bit? Um, if we share it a little bit, 
I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but, but then the question is even technologically, if the police come in and they seize the machine because they have probable cause to uh, search stuff about Kurt or because Kurt gives them a consent, what does that mean for me? And I think one of the real problems we see is that technologically the forensic 